Finnovate showcases cutting-edge banking and financial technology through a global conference series featuring short-form demos and thought leadership. Now, the conversation continues on the Finnovate podcast. Hi, and welcome to the Finnovate podcast. Joining me today, we have Kurt Lin, co-founder and CEO of Pinwheel. Kurt, thank you so much for joining me today. Thanks for having me, Greg. Really excited to be here. Excellent. So can you give us just a quick background on yourself and what Pinwheel is all about as we jump right in? Happy to. Uh, So a bit about myself. I've been in the uh, startup arena for a while, have had uh, a couple other uh, startups before this, uh, the most recent one with my co-founder, Curtis, as well. Uh, what we do at Pinwheel is pretty straightforward. We look at all the different uh, income sources that exist, whether it be payroll systems, uh, gig platforms, or future work platforms like Etsy, eBay, and we combine it into a, a platform and make it really easy for anyone uh, to connect their income account or their payroll account to any app for the purposes of sharing that data um, or to do things like update direct deposits as well. Excellent. So, I mean, it's a really interesting idea for a company. And I think it's going to be fun for us to explore kind of the roots of the company a little bit, because this came about through a rather unpleasant sort of personal experience that you witnessed with regards to your father around financial inclusion and specifically the problem of credit invisibility. Can you talk a little bit about why this is such an important issue to you personally? Yeah, absolutely. And it's also, I think, a, a problem and issue that is really deeply personal to my two co-founders as well. Um, all three of us growing up were second generation. Uh, and so our parents came over to this country. And one of the things that I personally saw is as uh, two traditional uh, Asian immigrants to this country, both my dad and my mom never took out any credit because frankly, carrying debt is largely anathema to being a good citizen and a good member of society. And uh, further to that, my dad was always this, you know, really traditional hardo type who uh, was never really that emotive. And frankly, it took the guy, you know, 40, 50 years before he could even say that he loved me. So, you know, that's, that's where we are these days. There we go. Yeah, that's, um, that underlines yeah. it. <laughs> and uh, I remember growing up, uh, for, when my dad went to go get a mortgage for the first time, I went with him. And I remember going door to door, bank to bank, and he kept getting rejected. And it was the first time in my life that I'd ever seen him really break emotionally. And that moment stuck with me, even though I was frankly too young to really understand what was going on. And I remember as I got older and I started to really understand what was actually happening, it made me realize that the financial system, frankly, just uh, isn't built to serve a lot of folks, especially those who have never engaged with the credit system before. True. Well, and I think what's really especially interesting about this example is you have a situation where somebody is making intelligent financial decisions. They're trying, I want to stay out of debt. I don't want to take on unnecessary debt. I want to live within my means. This is a good, responsible financial decision and something that I think we as an industry encourage people to do, live within their means. And then on the flip side, you get to this crucial moment where, okay, now I'm ready to take out a loan. I get to this point where I can't. And I think most people are in this bucket. You can't outright buy a house. You have to borrow to be able to buy a house. And in that moment, when you really needed it, you don't have access to credit because you've almost been too good. And I think that's one of those really difficult pieces to understand. On the flip side, you've got this group of bankers who were obviously not able to see uh, enough about your father to understand, no, he's actually a really good credit risk. They didn't have any data that would support that. So they're in this moment where they have to reject those mortgage applications. And I think one of the questions that you have here is, did anybody actually do anything wrong, quote unquote? In your eyes, did somebody here make a wrong decision at any point? And that's the really tough thing because the answer is no. Right. And if you think about all the different actors in the system, everyone is kind of acting uh, with a very rational lens here. If you look at a consumer who doesn't actually have the funds to pay back a loan, then they're doing the right rational thing by not taking out a loan. Right. At the same time, you look at a, a banker or a lender who is actually in the business of lending money and they look at someone and they say, well, hey, I don't have any information on this person. And so, the rational thing for me to do is to not give them uh, any credit because I have no idea whether they're going to pay back or not. And so everyone in the system is 
behaving the way that they're supposed to be. It's just that the system itself is fundamentally broken because of it, right? Because what you're really doing is you're actually punishing folks for being responsibly, uh, or sorry, I should say responsible financial actors, right? You don't take out uh, a loan for something you can't pay back. And now when you actually do need credit for the first time, you don't have anything to point to and say, well, hold on, I was doing the right thing by not taking out a loan and not repaying it. But now you're telling me that because I didn't do that, uh, or I didn't take out any credit before, I can't actually get it when I need it most. And that just seems really backwards. And then what we're excited to to solve, um, especially with the work that we're doing at Pinwheel is say, well, wait a second, if we can expand the amount of data that is actually uh, out there on each consumer, and you know who this person is, how much they make, where they work, how, and all that information around how they earn money. Now we can actually allow the bankers to be, again, rational actors, but make a much better decision because they have much more to work with now to actually say, yes, this person should actually be someone that we feel comfortable lending and giving credit to. Yeah, because and I think that's a really crucial piece. We'll explore that in just a minute, this idea of the being additional data points that we can go out and get. But otherwise, it's this kind of mentality where if you come to the US, you better start behaving like Americans do and needlessly purchasing items that you can't afford so that you can build up a credit history. This clearly can't be the answer that we're actually looking for. Although maybe our industry's recent uh, commitment to the buy now, pay later landscape would suggest otherwise. But let's come back to this idea around you know the additional data points that we can find because if you look at the banking limitations or sorry the limitations that bankers were under even you know a couple of decades ago they had to make credit decisions based on really imperfect and incomplete data because there wasn't a better way now of course we have access to a lot more data a lot more insights into who a person is how likely they are to pay us back what specific tools and insights do you guys use that can help us to kind of plug these holes and give bankers the opportunity to understand people in a more complete way? So I think the first place to start here is to really understand that there's two things that folks who have been doing risk for a long time think about when you look at a consumer. One is their willingness to pay, and then two is their ability to pay. And historically, we've actually had uh, a way to actually quantitatively measure willingness to pay, although it's certainly far from perfect. And that's a FICO score, right? This three-digit number is basically your passport to accessing affordable credit and actually being able to be a part of this uh, credit and financial system. The issue is that it just only looks at historical records, right? Like, have you been responsibly paying back uh, loans that you've taken out? Yes or no? And that's really it. The problem is that it ignores a much larger part of the puzzle which is the ability to pay. And that's why we're so excited about what we're building at, at Pinwheel, because whether it's us or other data providers, what you're really trying to do is paint a much more holistic picture of someone's financial life, right? And I think there's the simple things of just like, again, who is this person? How much do they make? Where do they work? How long have they worked there? And those are all really important foundational pieces to this. But as you start to really expand that outwards, you can say, well, wait a second, there's actually much more data here that can actually allow us to do lending and credit in whole new ways. And a good example of that is actually um, around earned wage access, for example. So if I know within your payroll system or some other data source that you have clocked in and clocked out of your shift today, at you know, Burger King or McDonald's or what have you, I can actually now, using that data, in real time, be able to advance you your paycheck for that day, even though you don't get paid for another two weeks, right? And that's just a, a very clear application of how this greater access to data informs newer financial products that are still achieving the goal of letting people access what they need to at a point where they need it most by just having more visibility into their true financial health. Yeah, and certainly we have so much more resources now. We have so many more interesting things to play with than we did even 10 years ago. I think another really interesting piece to highlight, you know, you and I were talking a little bit before we pushed record about the idea that you have to, you know, the traditional way of doing this kind of thing is you have to make a decision, a permanent decision based on one moment in time, one snapshot. As of right now, you know, the day, this day, this hour, here's where you stand, thumbs up or thumbs down. And, and that's ultimately not a, a super insightful or intelligent way of doing this either because the situations are constantly changing. People who are maybe uh, not 
don't appear to be good credit risks need the opportunity to kind of show that they can be or to work with financial institutions to have that more collaborative environment. Can you talk a little bit about that just so people who are listening have a sense of you know what we're talking about when you look at this kind of more collaborative lending environment? Great question, Greg. Uh, I think from a, when you take a step back and you think about the paradigm of credit, there's it's kind of wild that it's really been a snapshot, like you mentioned, and a point in time thing. And what I mean by that is when someone actually needs a loan or some sort of credit product, uh, they go to the lender and they say, hey, um, I need this product. Can you approve me? And so at that point in time, the lender is saying, okay, uh, given the, if all the information I have, I'm going to say yes or no. And then after that actually happens, then it's a black box, right? Then you have no idea whether or not they are going to default. You really just kind of cross your fingers and, and hope they don't. And it's a really powerful thing to be able to say, well, wait a second, is that actually the best way for us to be lending? Or actually, can we think about lending in a very different lens by starting to say, if I can actually have recurring vis- visibility and actually know how you are doing, especially from an income and employment perspective, in real time, you can start to change that dynamic from being a snapshot to actually being, per your point, a a collaborative dynamic ongoing relationship, right? Where I can say, yes, I will approve you now. And furthermore, I can continue to monitor and see, you know, on a downside uh, scenario, if you've, God forbid, been furloughed or had a reduction in hours or uh, worst case been terminated, I can actually get ahead of that, provide a loan modification and get a really good win-win here, whereas a lender that can protect my asset without you know, having it go down to zero. And at the same time, really help a consumer who's you know, at their bottom and at their worst be able to get some relief. And when they get back on track, get them uh, re-enabled. And that way, it's kind of a, a true, mutually beneficial dynamic. And furthermore, as you continue on the positive side of things, if that consumer has gotten a promotion or had an increase in pay, and they're trying to see them be even more stable, you can actually start to be able to provide them with even better rates or dynamically adjust accordingly, right? And so it moves away from this point in time to a longitudinal ongoing relationship, which will allow you to ultimately price risk and assess risk much better and in a whole new way that also allows consumers to actually be able to access the products they need. Yeah, well, and certainly I think it leads to a much more you know collaborative engagement than a kind of adversarial relationship because right now the sort of this idea I have to go in and you know not trick my banker, but I have to make my case that I'm a good credit risk so that I can get uh, a, a good loan at a good rate. Um, and so there's a sort of you're not adversarial, but you know I'm I'm not we're not in it together, right? I need to try and build my case. And w- with what you're talking about, all of a sudden you know the lender and the lendee are in the same boat. They both have the same goal of wanting that loan repaid naturally. This is not rocket science, right? But this is a much more conducive way to creating that reality where you have somebody who is much more likely to pay back the loan. This is kind of what um, I think is is really interesting about this. And a lot of people in fintech are looking out how can we take financial institutions and their customers and make them feel like they're on the same team. A huge number of people are focusing on this problem in a wide variety of areas. And here's one where it's kind of uh, really easy to see the benefits from that. So um, you know, we're approaching the end of our time here, and I want to just put this question out there. Obviously, this is uh, an issue that is difficult to see if you don't experience it, and I think it's good to be able to share this kind of story. If there are people who are listening who are interested in trying to solve this problem around financial inclusion, specifically the problem of credit invisibility, you know, obviously one answer would be come talk to us at Pinwheel. We are already working on it. What other advice do you have uh, for people who want to try and go out there and do something to change this, to fight against this? That's a great question. And I would also say, uh, as someone who preaches a bias for action uh, amongst my team, I, I, I love the spirit of this of this question. I think the first place to start as with uh, any problem is by educating yourself, right? And so I think that this is a great place to start by listening to podcasts. And I'm sure Finnovate has a number of other resources that are good to tap into as well. And so I really think it is about, first of all, really going deep and understanding what are all the core drivers that really cause uh, the problems that I care about solving the most. And then once you kind of have that foundation set, you will naturally, in that pursuit of knowledge, see that there's incredible innovators 
across the board doing some really, really uh, outstanding things. And I think at that point, it's about finding uh, the problem that you most feel compelled to solve and joining the team that you think is best solving that, right? There's this idea of kind of founder problem fit that gets talked about all the time um, in the investor and value community. And I think it's actually the same for, for, for people more broadly, right? As soon as you can find the problem that you care about solving most, you will naturally find the team that you think is doing the best job. And as a very biased operator myself, I think the best way you can make impact is by rolling up your sleeves and building. And so go go help build the, the future of the, of the financial system and hopefully making it one that is um, fair and more equitable for everyone. Yeah, no, I think that's true. And I love that idea that this idea that action is the most important thing. Now is a chance to go and build something. We have all these tools available. We have data available in a way that we didn't before. This is a great time for people who want to be creative and want to come in and look at some of these larger scale problems to come in and say, let's let's just take another look at what's possible because there's a lot more that's possible now than there used to be. And the more we kind of keep looking at that, and, and I also love the idea of finding other people who are doing it well, getting up there, you know, building your on your own, uh, setting yourself up so that you can create something, but also looking at what other people are doing, find the right kinds of teams. And I think this is a good way to, to solve a lot of these challenges. Well, um, Kurt, it's been an absolute pleasure chatting with you. Thanks again for taking the time. Thank you, Greg. This was a pleasure and I hope we can do it again soon. The Finnovate podcast is produced by Informa Connect in association with Provoke.fm Media. Check out Finnovate.com for information on Finnovate's upcoming shows and to learn how you can get involved. The discount code Finnovate Podcast will save you 20% on tickets to all of our events. And you can email us at info at for information on sponsoring, speaking, or demoing. Thanks for listening. <laughs>